Your Excellency, Mr. Aula Ford Ragnar Crimson, President of the Republic of Iceland. Your Excellency, Mr. Gunnar Bragi Svensson, Minister of Foreign Affairs and External Trade of Iceland. Madam Begdis Finnbogadotir, former President of Iceland. Uh, Honorable Vice Speaker Christian Moller, thank you very much for your participation. Madam uh, Christine Ingolfsdottir, Rector of the University of Iceland, Ambassador uh, Greta Gunnarsdottir, Permanent Representative of uh, Iceland to the United Nations, distinguished faculty members, dear students, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and privilege for me to address at this very distinguished historical university with the history of more than 100 years ago, 100 years. Cotton dined, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Talk. <coughs> Thank you for your warm welcome. It's really an honor to visit this beautiful country. I heard a lot about Iceland, and I've really been longing for a day when I could be able to visit Iceland. Uh, this is, I know, the northernmost, the highest altitude uh, capital in the world. It seems to me that uh, the sky and moon it's much closer than I was seeing from in New York. And I welcome to have this opportunity to speak at these really prestigious universities. And I'm particularly honored by the unexpected presence of His Excellency President Crimson. I was telling him that he seems to be not guided by his protocol people. I didn't expect him to be here, and I really uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, the, by being in Iceland, I'm very much energized uh, here in Iceland. Maybe it's uh, something to do with the uh, remarkable Hatley City uh, geothermal power stations. I was uh, just there about half an hour ago, and I got a lot of energy from there. But I'm also charged up. Uh, by being in a country where the government and people are such good global citizens and long-standing friends of the United Nations. I, I'd like to really thank and congratulate the government of Iceland uh, for being another, having added another first, ranking first in the world uh, by ratifying this uh, arms trade treaty. As you may be very proud, uh, <clears throat> Iceland was ranked number one last year by World Economic Forum uh, in their global uh, gender index, gender gap index. You are the number one country in terms of uh, gender empowerment and gender equality. And just a couple of weeks ago, you were ranked number one as the the country most peaceful, most peaceful, and most livable country in the world. And I really congratulate uh, all of you for having made your country as such a most beautiful, most livable, most peaceful, and most leading by example country in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I begin, let me extend a special greeting to the members of the UNICEF and UN Women National Committee and also the United Nations Association of uh, Iceland who are here today. You are great allies of the United Nations in sharing with your fellow citizens what we do and why it matters. Feeding the hungry, sheltering refugees, supporting elections, vaccinating children, and getting them into school. If I may be a little bit more specific, we feed at least 100 billion people every day. 
And we are accommodating 36 million refugees every day. We vaccinate 60% of world's children, saving lives of many young children around the world. There are many more and more what United Nations are doing. But as Foreign Minister said, I'm not alone. Because we have such a dedicated people and government like Iceland, that's why I can do it. We can do it. We are keeping peace, keeping violence from breaking out in the first place. This is the United Nations missions every day, every night around the world. Iceland makes important contribution across this agenda. You host important training programs of the United Nations University in geothermal energy, fisheries, land restoration, and empowerment of women. I met all of them uh, this afternoon. Your deep connection to the marine environment has generated a very strong support for the Law of the Sea Convention. You are a global leader in renewable energy, giving the world a glimpse of the possibility of sustainable low emissions future. You are leading by example in building a better and sustainable future for all of us. And while Iceland may seem somewhat alone up here near the top of the planet, the country is outward looking, fully engaged with the world across a full spectrum of a human need. You support international criminal justice and human rights. You are one of the few just one of the 10 countries who ratified Rome Statute of International Criminal uh, Court. And even at a time when Iceland was enduring its own deep economic and financial crisis, you strived to uphold your commitment to help the world's poorest and most vulnerable uh, countries. And I thank you for that, for that strong commitment. Ladies and gentlemen, that sense of global solidarity has never been more needed. These are trying times for all the people, all the countries around the world. It's not only Iceland. Over the past several years, the world has faced wave upon wave of crisis. A job crisis, a food crisis, water crisis, energy crisis, and economic and financial crisis that struck Iceland and many others with a particular force, and which is unfortunately still with us in many parts of this world. We are seeing dramatic changes to the global landscape. New powers are rising as dynamism shifts to the global south. Now there is a much increased south-south cooperation. The shift of political and economic are just coming from several emerging uh, countries like China, India, and Brazil, South Africa, and Indonesia, and you name your several others. You are more connected than ever before. However wide it may be this planet Earth, this world can be connected within a blink of, within a, less than a second. There are more of us than ever before, including the largest ever generation of young people. Ten, half of this global population is under 25 years of age. This world is very young. This world is half, the population is women, and half of them, again, 25 years of young age. Therefore, one of the priorities of the United Nations is to work for and to work with youth and women. That is what we are doing, and I have said it as one of my five priorities as a the Secretary General of the United Nations. 
We are again, ladies and gentlemen, witnessing the gathering force of climate change. Politics are on the move as people in the Arab world and elsewhere demand greater freedom and the bigger say in the decisions affecting their lives. It's been mostly women and young people who have been going out to the street and yearning for their rightful opportunities, rightful choices. I've been, I've been speaking to the world leaders that listen carefully what their voices are. Listen to their voices, what their challenges and aspirations are. We are still seeing it in some parts of the world, as we are seeing in Egypt and in Brazil and many other parts of the world. And people in Syria, they are still um, not being able to have what they really want, they are entitled to have. But let me be clear, amid great change and challenges, I see also great possibilities. I see country after country and leader after leader recognizing that we can only tackle our challenges when we are working together, when you are working with the United Nations. My job as a Secretary General is to harness these dynamic force to build a better future for all. That means sustainable development and sustainable peace. When there is no sustainable development, you cannot expect peace sustainable. When there is no justice, no development, peace can only be a temporary. If you really want to have a sustainable peace, you must have accountability and justice, and you must have people feel that they are served. Mm -hmm. Let me say a few words about each of this. Iceland is taking big steps to promote sustainable energy, both at home and around the world. I have seen it for myself, and I commend you for it. Energy will be critical in realizing sustainable development, in helping us avoid the worst impacts of climate change, and in making much needed transition to sustainable development. My Sustainable Energy for All initiative, which I announced last year, aims to help jumpstart uh, this uh, transition. It brings together the main actors, governments, business, and others. It focuses on dramatic increase in energy access, efficiency, and the use of renewables by 2030. These are three objectives of my Sustainable Energy for All initiative. First, by 2030, we will provide all 8 billion people access to energy, electricity. And second, double the energy efficiency. And thirdly, double the use of renewable energy in global energy mix. These are three very ambitious targets. We believe that energy is a golden thread. Without energy, you cannot <clears throat> expect anything to do. Can you run hospital to save lives? Can doctors operate? Can you teach children? Can women deliver babies? You cannot do anything. Can you run automobiles or trains or airplanes without energy? President Crimson is a member of this advisory board. This is yet another good example of Iceland leadership. He is the only head of state who is participating in that advisory board. While we have several ministers or economic uh, experts, the transition to a sustainable future also depends on achieving the Millennium Development Goals. These are the blueprints the world leaders gathered in 2000 at the dawn of 
millennium, 2000, including President Crimson, at the United Nations, laying out the blueprint for the world's better and well-being of all 7 billion people for combating hunger, disease, illiteracy, and environmental degradation. The MDGs have been the most successful anti-poverty push in history. Yesterday in Geneva, uh, during ECOSOC uh, meeting, I launched our latest MDG report documenting both progress and challenges. Many countries have made the great uh, strides and progress in meeting these eight pillars, eight goals. But at the same time, uh, many countries in the developing world, they are still struggling uh, to meet these targets. Two important tasks now stand before us. We have less than 1,000 days to meet this target. Then our answer is that we must accelerate this process by the end of December 2015. We have less than 1,000 days. Second, we must shape a global agenda beyond 2015. Now what we will do after 2015? We should have a set of goals again for sustainable development. That is what member states are working very hard to define sustainable development goals. Instead of MDGs, it will be SDGs. Our aim is to give full voice to the world's views and aspirations. And we are engaging civil society, private sector, scientists, scholars, government leaders, and many others, the people on the street. We should build on the gains of the MDGs, and we should go where the MDGs could not and did not. More deeply, for example, into the empowerment of young people. More fully, into sustainability and the importance of governance and institutions. And more inclusively, with the shared responsibilities for all countries. I will set down my own thoughts in a report in the month ahead. Before the, when the leaders are gathered in the United Nations in September, on September 25th, uh, they will be able to have my own thoughts on how the world can be better with the sustainable visions for economic, social, and environmental uh, dimensions. I look forward to Iceland's continuing contributions to these efforts. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, sustainable development is inseparable from sustainable peace. This is what I said. I came into office determined to heighten the United Nations emphasis on prevention, on low-cost, high-yield investment. Prevention from man-made crisis, prevention from disaster, natural disasters. We now have mediation specialists ready to deploy to any parts of the world where we see the symptoms of crisis within 72 hours. We are strengthening ties with the regional organizations, African Union, and all other regional organizations in Africa and elsewhere. We are on the ground with the political missions and regional offices and peacekeeping missions. As of yesterday, we have established uh, peacekeeping missions in Mali. And we are doing more to support civil society so agreements more fully reflect the will of the people. We must also bring more women into key positions in peace processes, both as UN mediators and among the parties to talk. The gender dimensions of the conflict and action against the sexual violence must be priorities for peace. At the same time, we are acting to bolster UN peacekeeping. 
peacekeepers today, we have 120,000 soldiers in 15, now 16 uh, different uh, uh, missions. Where we have security threats and volatile political instabilities. Our challenge is to consider new ways to meet these goals. For example, for the first time in the history of the United Nations peacekeeping operations, the Security Council, upon my recommendation, has authorized the peacekeepers in Democratic Republic of the Congo to, to deploy an intervention brigade. This is a brigade of 3,000 soldiers who have a special mandate to enforce the peace, to enforce and to make peace instead of just to keep the peace. But the paramount focus of our efforts is to implement peace agreement. Wherever peace can be agreed, then we are doing before we employ and deploy uh, peacekeepers. That is why what uh, that is why I have appointed the recently the Madame Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland, as my special envoy for Democratic Republic of the Congo. She is the first woman mediator and peace negotiator in the history of the United Nations. While the situation remains volatile, we believe this comprehensive new approach gives the DRC and the Great Lake region people as a best chance for peace and economic development in many years. Our most immediate peace and security challenge is of course the crisis in Syria. The conflict has spawned a huge humanitarian crisis and risks destabilizing the entire region. We have at this time more than 1.7 million people who are refugees, who are now staying in four neighboring countries, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, and uh, Turkey. And one fourth, 25% of total Syrian people have been affected and they need immediate, urgent humanitarian assistance inside Syria. And almost 100,000 people have been killed during the last two years and three months. It's a totally unacceptable uh, situation. We are doing our best to bring this, to bring to an end of this crisis through political uh, dialogue. I'm, required, I'm mandated to convene an international conference. We are working very hard to make the groundwork for this international uh, conference as soon as uh, possible. The people of Syria need peace, but all they have for the moment are uh, talks after talks about talks, and I believe that we must do uh, better. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is a moment that cries out for good international solutions and for effective multilateralism in that United Nations stands. No nation on its own can address today's serious and multiple threats. However, however powerful or resourceful a country may be, this we cannot do it alone. We have to work together. Every nation can gain by working with others. While each and every one cannot do all, if we are united, each and, each and every one can do something. Can do something. This is a basic spirit of multilateralism. Iceland knows about navigating stormy seas and uncertain skies. Sailors are your country's heroes. Your air traffic controllers are responsible for a critical part of global airspace. I have no doubt that the people of Iceland have much to offer in helping this world find its way to the stronger sense of 
collective purpose that will in turn lead us to a sustainable future for all of us. I, I strongly propose and suggest to you that let us work together with all the member states together, united, to build a better future for all of us. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.